Thanks very much. And I would like to thank the University of Suffolk and Marco and all its stats board for the opportunity to present today. Um, so in this presentation, I want to share with you some of the high intensity demands of hurling and how we're working with some of the players to prepare them for these running demands. So I'm conscious that we may have people outside of Ireland watching this presentation. So firstly, I'd like to give a short introduction to the game of hurling. So hurling is a stick and ball sport played by players who are amateur. Um, the stick used is called a hurley, made from ash, and the, the players um, choose their own size, which is approximately 88 centimetres. The ball, which you can see on the right-hand side, has changed from white to yellow this year and is a little bit bigger than a tennis ball. And it can travel up to speeds of up to 150 kilometers an hour, make it a, a really, really fast and dynamic game. The game is played on an area which is 145 meters by 90 meters, approximately 40% larger than a soccer pitch. It is a 15 a side game with five substitutes permitted at any stage. Um, and the game is duration, the playing duration is played over over two periods of 35 minutes. So the, the aim of the game is to outscore the opposing team by striking the ball either over the crossbar or under the crossbar. Um, the goals is like similar to a rugby post and underneath the crossbar, you get a goal and over the crossbar, you get a point. And on average, there's 35 shots a goal with an average of two goals and 25 points per game. So this makes it a really, really entertaining and highly dynamic game with a score occurring every two seconds. So there are 15 players in each team, 14 outfield players with a goalkeeper, and positions are generally organized into positional lines, full back line, half back line, midfield, half forward, and, and full forward line. In each positional line, there's a convention player to player marking where attackers try to invade the defender's area and score. And all players are free to move anywhere in the pitch. Now, the role differs between backs and forwards, depending on where you are. Midfielders, like other sports, act as a link between attack and defence, and they tend to move to where the ball is located. The full back line and full forward line usually stay close to the goals uh, to attempt to score or uh, deny scoring opportunities. And scores can be attempted from 70 to 80 metres away from goals, so players need to be marking closely throughout the game. I'd now like to share a short piece of video uh, to give you an understanding of, of, of the game. The game can just change by one puck of a ball being hit 100 yards. So a couple of things that um, I hope you're maybe able to observe that hurling is often described as a, a random chaotic invasion type game where the technical skills of the game require high levels of coordination. Um, the ball can travel from one end of the field to, to the other very, very quickly. So players have to be really alert uh, all the time. Uh, and the players can be engaged quite, quite suddenly. Um, so the sport is unique in that players represent the county or the place, the community where they're born. 
and there's no transfer market. So this is one of the reasons why the game is so popular. Uh, the fact that they get, get to play with their community against other, other uh, communities. So the emphasis then is placed on each county to develop their own players to reach the elite levels. So knowledge of what the players are required to do in the game is really, really important. And until recently, there was very little known about the running demands of hurling. So in a 70-minute game, hurlers cover on average 7,800 metres or 109 metres every minute. Now, we know that this distance is accumulated over a number of different speeds. This intermittent game challenges the players to change speed very frequently. Um, but for today, and I'm just going to focus maybe on the higher intensity activities. So players reach a maximum speed of on average 8.4 meters per second and cover a, a total sprint distance of 415 meters in a game. But this is a total value of 70 minutes. So what we discovered when looking at the game, not all sprints were the same. So let's find out what are the sprint demands of hurling. So as coaches, we usually plan and implement speed drills by marking out set distances for players to sprint to and from. So therefore, um, we need to design specific sprint drills. We, we, we needed to find out and quantify how many sprints occur under 20 meters and over 20 meters. Now, from the video, you can see that hurling is a, a really dynamic intermittent game and players can reach maximum speeds. But what we wanted to know is how many times do they sprint up near their peak speed? Because if they do, well, these sprints are more demanding than other sprints. So each player's peak speed was tested over 40 meter uh, sprint test. And out of that, their sprints were classified into three categories from 6.1 meters per second up to 80% of their speed. Now, 6.1 meters per second was a, an original uh, sprint threshold using the research in hurling. And the second category was between 80 and 90% and the third category being above 90% of their peak speed. We quantified the duration between the sprints to find out how frequent the sprints occurred over the game and the number of repeated sprint bouts. And that is, we defined as how many sprints occurred uh, back to back. So two sprints within the 60 seconds. Now, the criteria for a sprint was that the player must be running over 6.1 meters per second and hold it for at least one second. So what, what you as a strength and conditioning coach need to figure out is how long it takes your players to reach this sprint threshold. So the results from the study found that on average, there was 22 sprints in the game, with the majority of sprints, that is 14, occurring under the 20 meters and eight sprints over the 20 meters. So when setting up our sprint activities, we should include mainly sprints under the 20 meters, but also include those over the 20 meters so that players are, are ready for them. Now, the average duration between the sprints was 208 seconds. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, we can see an example of the player sprints throughout the game. As you can see, the sprints can be grouped together, as we see in the start on the left-hand side of the graph. And then at times, the sprints can have a longer duration between them. Now, there was on average five repeated sprint bouts. So that is on five occasions, there was two sprints back to back within that 60 seconds. Now, remember we wanted to find out how many times the players sprinted near their peak speed or within 90% of that uh, sprint uh, peak. So when we break down the intensity of the sprints, the highest number of sprints occurred between 6.1 meters per second and 80% of their players max speed. And there was 11 of those. They perform on average eight sprints between 80 and 90% of their max speed. And on average, players sprint up near their peak speed three times in a game. So these results really emphasize the, the importance that players 
performance sprints of varying speeds in, um, in training to preparing them for the match. So we need to think about setting up um, practices where the distances are long enough so the players can reach over that 90% threshold of their, of their speed, especially if they're starting from a, a standing start uh, in, in drills. So remember, we divided the, the playing positions into five positional lines, and we analyzed the following metrics, the number of sprints, the number of sprints under and over 20 meters, the peak speed, the number of sprints um, under 80%, between 80 and 90 and 90%, uh, the duration between sprints, and the number of repeated sprint bouts. And what we found was that there was no difference between positions for any of these six metrics. So when we're setting up these sprint training practices, all positions can train together. Now, it's often the case, the players may be divided into smaller groups for positional practices or small sided games. Now, if that is the case, it's very important that players are reaching the same amount of sprints, no matter what individual practice or small sided games uh, are going on. Now, this year, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, the games of hurling were played over four quarters. Now, we've just published a paper describing the match demands per quarter. Again, just focusing on the high intensity demands, if we look at the graph on the left hand side of the screen, it shows the high speed running distance per quarter. Now, players cover the greatest distance in quarter one in high speed running compared to all other quarters. So there was a, a notice that the distance reduced in quarter two. But an interesting finding was there was no difference in high speed running between quarter two, three, and four. So the 15 minute halftime period after quarter two seems to be long enough to help players recover from the first half. Now, another study showed that the ball is only in play for 30 of the 70 minutes. Now, this is common right across sports. So players within hurling may be recovering within the game between those high-speed running uh, bouts. Now, if we move to the right of the screen, we see the sprint distance covered per quarter. And if you notice that there was no difference found between quarters for both the total sprint distance and the number of sprints per quarter. So again, players need to be able to perform similar sprint demands throughout the game. Now, in hurling, it is common practice to play sprint training at the start of our training sessions so that players are fresh enough and we attempt to increase their max speed. But looking at the data, we see that players perform sprints uh, at the start, middle, and towards the end of, of games as well. So if this is the case, we need to, we may need to play some sprints towards the end of training so that the players can perform a sprinting action when they're fatigued. But again, think about a periodization approach and progressively overload the number of sprints as we do um, throughout the game towards the middle and end of training. So when discussing the high intensity demands of hurling, we need to consider the maximum intensity period. Now we investigate the maximum running intensities of total distance, high speed running and sprint distance. And these are assessed for the full game and per position. So over 22 games, the maximum one minute up to 10 minute periods were assessed using a, a rolling average method. So if we remember back to earlier, the total distance covered on average is 109 meters every minute. Now this can be seen on the top of the slide. Now this was averaged out over 70 minutes and can be seen with the black lines on the graph. Now the difficulty with using this method to analyze the running demands is that these long durations, uh, for example, the 70 minutes, or if we're looking at it over a half, hide the fluctuation in high intensity activity within the game. Because the low intensity periods like walking and jogging bring down the average. Now looking at the average, 
data only it, uh, has been shown to underestimate these maximum intensity periods and these which players need to be prepared for. Now, as we said, to calculate the maximum intensity period, we, we looked at dividing the 70 minutes into one minute periods and calculated using a rolling average method. And then the highest volume completed for a one minute period was identified as the maximum intensity period. So instead of the average 109 meters per minute, we see that the maximum intensity period was actually 184 meters per minute for total distance. Now, likewise, if we look at the bottom of the slide, the yellow bars represent the average high speed running distance per minute. And this was 12 meters per minute. And the blue bars represent the sprint distance per minute, which was eight meters per minute. Now, again, this was averaged out over the 70 minutes. However, the maximal one minute period for high intensity running, which we see in red, uh, was actually 54 meters per minute. And for the sprint distance, it was 42 meters per minute in green. Now, interestingly, these maximum intensity periods can occur uh, in either half and can be different between players. So if our conditioning sessions are based just on the average, we might be under preparing players for the maximum intensity periods in the game. But these maximum intensity periods are only one minute in duration. Um, so we need to factor that in, but they do occur and players need to be ready for them. So the maximum intensity periods per position show that full backs and full forwards, which play on the out uh, and closest to the goal on e either side, perform the lowest maximum intensity high speed running compared to the middle three positions, half backs, midfielders and half forwards. Now these differences in positions may be explained by specific tactical roles. But if you look at the sprint distance maximum intensity period, we, found, we also found that there was no difference between any positions. So the results show that all players, no matter what position, need to be able to complete the peak sprint maximum intensity periods uh, in a game. So let's now look at some of the things we need to consider when designing training activities to prepare the players for competition demands. So when we set up our sprint training, we need to think about the distance of the sprint, especially when players are starting from a standing start. Take for the example of the player starting on the zero meter line from a standing start. We ask them to run that 20 meters, but how much of that run is really a sprint? So if we visualize that run, the green part of the graph shows the run at the, uh, the start of the run. Now this is mainly the acceleration phase. And towards the end, they might be reaching that sprint threshold, depending on how fast they're running. Now, the results in hurling show that the majority of sprints occur under the 20 meters. But remember, that is over the sprint threshold. So if that's the case, from a standing start, the length of the overall run may need to be longer, for example, up to 30 meters. Now, in the, this example in B, there is more sprint distance being performed because of the additional length. Now, results from the sprint study show that hurlers reach near their peak speeds on average three times in the game. So if we want to ensure that players are reaching their near their peak speeds or their peak speeds, the sprints distance may, that we set up may need to be over that 30 meters to ensure that they're reaching the, those peak speeds. So the top left hand corner is a typical small side again. So in, in a uh, 40 by 40 meters squared area, players might be keeping possession of the ball. Now, this sort of game usually ends up with the players performing lower speeds. And 
if this is the case, they may get used to living at that slower speed. So to adapt this game, and we look at B, we could add a goals at each end of the playing area. And this will give a player as a focus to attack and defend each of the goals. And as they switch between attacking and defending, they're more likely to be able to change the speed. And they're also experienced that sport-specific decisions of, of when to pass, where to pass, uh, who to pass to, where to run, etc. Now, the difficulty is that focusing just on one goals at each end can often result in players playing narrow and down the middle. So if we look over to the example in C, we could introduce an American football type end, end uh, zone game uh, where players may be striking the ball to their teammates to catch within the zone. Now, we could also add further rules to the game. For example, in D, we could include a halfway line where the attacking team must get all their players into the attacking half in order to score. And again, this will help players move up and down the pitch. Now, the size of the playing area, area will dramatically influence the, the player's ability to sprint and opportunities to sprint. So remember, they need to reach 6.1 meters per second for a sprint to count. So if the area is restricted in space, like in A, players will be limited by the sidelines or their opponents. And as a result, will find it difficult to reach this sprint speed. Now, if we move them onto the example in B, increasing the playing dimensions will allow the players more opportunity to, to perform sprints as there's more space to run into and get away from their opponents. It may be a boring go, uh, game, uh, but this time reduce the numbers are involved. For example, uh, after a set duration that the four players on the sideline might come into play and another four leave. And this will give more space to sprint into or get away from their, um, or chase their opponents. It would also provide that additional time between sprints. Now, if we move on to D, we can see, we can play the same game as C, but this time the players who are not involved in the game could be performing their sprints uh, within the sprint station. Or if you wanted, all players could perform their sprints between repetitions of small sided games. Now, we know that there are maximum intensity periods within the game. So we need to ensure that the players are able to withstand and be resilient um, for these maximum intensity periods. So a couple of ideas to replicate these in training. So if we're playing small city games, we can ensure that there's more ball in play time. So when the ball goes out of play, um, be it over a sideline or through the goals, another ball is immediately ready to be put back into play. And this will ensure that the, the players are active for that one minute period. Now the game rules need to facilitate the players being able to get up to that maximum intensity period. If players are able to strike the ball to each other, the ball might be moving around the area instead of the players. So for example, we could limit the striking for a set duration, for example, a minute, and then go back into the original game. We also need to consider the number of players within the game. Uh, if there are too many for the space, then the work will be divided out between the players and overall will remain lower than the maximum intensity period. And finally, uh, if you feel that the players are not able to reach that max intensity period within the small city game, you could <clears throat> provide that additional conditioning for a mi one minute block outside uh, before, during, or after that small city game. So to summarize, uh, hurlers cover a total distance of an average 7,800 meters with a relative distance of 109 meters per minute. They reach peak speeds of 8.4 meters per second with on average an overall sprint distance of 415 meters.
This 415 meters consists of at least 22 sprints, with the majority of sprints happening under 20 meters. Now, we should allow enough space to reach over that 90% peak speeds because they happen uh, on average three times in the game. Um, and also, they perform different intensities of sprints. Now, repeated sprints happen on five occasions, which are rare, but they do happen. Now, we see that there is no positional difference in the sprint demands. And high speed running decreases after quarter one with no difference afterwards. There was no difference in the sprint demands between quarters. And we must consider the maximum intensity periods along with the average data. And including those maximum intensity periods uh, within training uh, to prepare those for the match play. So the practical applications, again, think about the length of sprints that you're prescribing. Are they long enough to get the players up to the sprint threshold? Uh, we need to practice sprints uh, over the session. So maybe during, uh, before, during, and after, um, and at different time points throughout the session. Uh, we need to think about the size of our small-sided games and will they facilitate the sprints that occur and also include your maximum intensity periods. And we may consider then varying the time of the max intensity period. So in some sessions, we might provide max intensity period uh, at the start and then middle and towards the end of the session. So here are some of the references used in the, the presentation. And these studies are available on ResearchGate. So if you look up my profile, or Google the profile, uh, Damien Young, the, these, along with all the hurling research uh, publications, are available uh, through ResearchGate. So again, I'd like to thank uh, the University of Suffolk and especially Marco and all at Stat Sports for their invitation to present today and for their continued support um, through my research and with, with Tipperary. So I hope you all take something from this presentation and thanks for listening.